This meeting is being recorded. Good evening. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Tacoma Pierce County and our co-sponsors, welcome to this forum for candidates for the Washington State House for Legislative District 29. Thank you to the candidates and to the audience for taking time to participate in this forum. My name is Liz Knox and I will be the moderator. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization whose mission for the past 102 years has been to encourage the informed and active participation of citizens in government. We conduct candidate forums in order to provide voters with information on which to base their votes. This forum is for the primary election, which is August 2nd. Forums for this election are held only for races in which there are three or more candidates. When the league holds a forum, all candidates have been invited. With us at this forum in alphabetical order are Charlotte Mena for position two and Melanie Morgan for position one. We expected Brett Johnson, but he was apparently unable to attend. The other candidates, Tim Monahan and Melissa Knott, either did not respond or chose not to participate. Ground rules have been sent in advance to the candidates. Candidates, do you agree to follow the ground rules, including agreeing to those regarding any recording of this forum and to speak only to the issues not about each other? Please indicate your agreement to all ground rules with a thumbs up. Great, thank you. Our timekeeper is Terry Baker. She will hold up cards to let you know when you have 60 seconds remaining, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, and when it is time to stop. When you see the card, you may finish a short sentence. Please stay on gallery view so that you can see the timekeeper. Also, please mute yourself when it is not your turn to speak. Each candidate has up to two minutes for an opening statement. These will be given in alphabetical order. After that, the order of answering questions will rotate typically with 60 seconds for each candidate, but that may be longer in some cases. Each candidate will get the same amount of time to answer in every case. At the end, closing statements may be up to one minute and will be given in reverse order of the opening statement. The order for the opening two minute statements is in alphabetical order, so we will begin with Ms. Mena. Ms. Mena? Great, well, thank you so much for having me and I'm really excited to be talking to the League of Women Voters. As you know, my name is Charlotte Mena. I'm a candidate for state representative in position two in the 29th legislative district. I'm a community organizer and a public servant with a decade of experience working in federal and state government um, on all kinds of issues that affect working families and voting rights. But I'm also the very proud daughter of Mexican immigrants who came to this country doing farm work in California and Oregon and all the way into Washington state. My parents met cutting meat at the IVP plant in Eastern Washington, and you know they took turns taking care of us kids, working day and night shifts, and really instilled in us the values of hard work and community service. So after becoming the first person in my family to graduate from college, I dedicated my career to public service, starting out in Congress, where I got to work on implementation of the Affordable Care Act for bringing a lot of these skills home to Washington State, where I was very proud to work in the state legislature, uh, in the state Senate specifically on families like paid family and medical leave. I'm running in this district now because we have a lot of longstanding issues that we've been dealing with for too long. And I think it's time for a new generation to step up and take responsibility for those issues. I'm really excited to be here with Representative Morgan who's already been leading on these issues such as housing and so many others that are important to the 29th. And I'm excited to um, partner with her and partner with members of the state legislature to keep working on these issues. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Morgan, your opening statement, please. Yes, good evening. My name is Melanie Morgan, and I am running for this, the House of Representatives for the 29th Legislative District Position 1. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for inviting me here tonight. For over 30 years, I have been engaged in our community as a public server. As a veteran of the Army, I'm a leader who believes in working together as a team. I applied this belief as a housing commissioner and as a school board director with Franklin Pierce, where I was is influential in getting a bond passed after two decades. Since 2019, I have been putting people first as the state representative for the 29th legislative district. 
and I serve in several leadership positions as a deputy majority floor leader, chair of the member color caucus, chair of the social equity and cannabis task force. The committees I currently serve on are Rural Development Act, Agriculture and Natural Resources, Commerce and Gaming, Finance, and the Rules Committee. My legislation and budget requests are equitable and community-based, such as the hair discrimination, installment payments for tenant move-in costs, adding sexual harassment to the legislature ethic codes, equity in cannabis, and uh, Juneteenth and the state paid holiday. I brought home to Pierce County over $140 million in budget requests for items such as a community center, a homeless shelter, equity in farming and ranching, a transportation study, a community reinvestment account, and more. I would love to return to Olympia as your state representative to continue passing equitable and meaningful legislation and being the leader that we deserve here in the 29th legislative district. Thank you. Thank you. And now to the questions. Ms. Mena, you will be first. And the first question is, what do you see as the most important issues for the 29th legislative district at this time? And how will you address those issues? Sure, thank you for that question. I think there's no shortage of issues that we need to work on in the 29th. What I hear at the doors most predominantly is folks that are concerned about public safety. Um, I hear folks concerned about the housing crisis and the increased cost of living in the area. I think there's a lot the legislature can do in those, in those areas specifically. Um, I wanna start by saying that the legislature has invested a significant amount of money in the Criminal Justice Training Commission um, and continue to support you know, policing um, that is responsible. And I wanna say that I don't think that police accountability and having you know, folks show up when we need them are mutually exclusive concepts. So I wanna support both of those things going forward. As far as housing, I think we have to continue to do the good work of you know, funding um, rental assistance and things that will help people keep a roof over their head and stay in their homes before, before they become unhoused. Um, we have to work on rapid housing. We have to marry general fund dollars to some of those capital investments for rapid housing. And we have to keep working on rental assistance and, and much, much more tenant protections. Um, as far as affordability, I think, you know, it's our, our role to really take leadership in bringing good paying jobs, union jobs to the district. And I'll be looking for opportunities to um, partner with other legislators to make sure we bring some of those dollars home. Thank you. Ms. Morgan, the same question. If you could repeat the question, please. <laughs> I would be happy to. What do you see as the most important issues for the 29th legislative district at this time? And how will you address those issues? Uh, yes, and I would just bounce off of what my future seatmate had said, and all those things are important. I would like to continue with um, bringing tenant protections also in housing affordability and in home ownership, also in climate and in equitable in ranching and farming. We don't have anyone, any communities of color farming at this time in the state of Washington, especially in large farms. So I'd like to continue those items. And addressing homelessness is important. Why I wanna bring back the legislation of creating a state housing department so that we can efficiently focus on all housing issues. Also making sure that our families are safe publicly and that racial um, equity is happening throughout the district. So kind of all of the issues that I have already brought to the district, I'm looking at continuing and also bring, hearing new voices that my seatmate will be bringing with the new issues, whether that be around immigration or climate change or working families. So I think that the best thing that we could do together for uh, she and I is to ensure that we are serving the people in an equitable, diversified and inclusive manner. Thank you. And Ms. Morgan, you'll be first on this next question. As a legislator, how would you balance the interests of the 29th district versus needs in other areas of the county and the state? Time. How much time? One minute, 60 One. seconds for the remainder of the question. Sorry. Oh, okay. I'm sorry that I'm, I'm, can you repeat the question? I was kind of ready to go there. <laughs> Absolutely, no problem. As a legislator, how would you balance the interests of your specific district versus needs in other areas of the county and the state? 
Yeah, the reality is, as a state legislator, when I pass legislation at a state level, it affects the whole state. So regardless, it doesn't preempt any local legislation, but when I pass Juneteenth as a state paid holiday, that affects the whole state on, from all four corners. So I would just continue in any legislation that I'm looking first in ensuring that the 29th has its resources. But when I'm looking at law that affects my district, I also know that it affects the whole state of Washington. Thank you. Ms. Mena, the same question. Sure, yeah. Um, I certainly agree with what Representative Morgan shared and will say that you know all of our communities are really interconnected. So for example, when we talk about the housing crisis and we're talking about homelessness, we can't just be thinking about the 29th because we have a housing market up and down the Puget Sound region. When we talk about water availability or climate change or wildfires that may be happening in Eastern Washington, but that's affecting everyone across the state, you know, water availability. Uh, commerce, trade, everything that we do that has statewide impact and significance has a direct impact on the voters in the 29th district um, and all the residents who, uh, who live here. So I think it is a, a both and rather than an either or. Thank you. And for our next question, Ms. Mana, you will be first. How would you respond to someone who does not support the current Washington state system for mail-in voting and wants to return to physical polling places? Well, I think, you know, I'm certainly always open to conversations. I would point out that mail-in voting is one of the safest and most secure election structures uh, that we have. Um, that's been proven in Washington state and there are congressional reports to back that up. I think that it might be more costly to return to an in-person voting system. Uh, and so I, I'm really happy with what we have. I'm always willing to explore options that will expand access to the ballot box to more folks. But I think what we have here is really a nation leading system of voting that is working really well and providing accessibility to folks across the state on tribal reservations and much, much more. So my interest really is in continued expansion of access to the ballot box and how we can continue to keep it safe and functional uh, and continue to uh, enfranchise voters that have been typically marginalized. Thank you. And Ms. Morgan, same yes, question. Thank you. I believe that it's uh, the way we are voting now with mail-in ballots are extremely equitable. And especially from the 29th, where we have a transportation issue in getting to the ballot box in the first place. But for those who do want to still participate in going somewhere to vote in person, they can still go down to the county elections office to still vote in person and turn in their ballots. But um, I believe that we are moving towards the future as we have been uh, in the last two years been virtual that we actually need to be probably moving to online voting. So it's actually not moving backwards, but moving forward and being innovative in the election process is where I'd like to, to go. Thank you. And the next question, and this one will be for Ms. Mena to start. What should the legislature do to prepare the state for the next pandemic or other regional emergency? That is a great question because I think emergencies will always happen and continue to happen. So I'll just say right now, I serve on the governor's task force, uh, pandemic task force after action review. I'm a representative of the immigrant community appointed by the governor to take stock of what went well and what we can do better. So I wanna reserve you know, public statements until we've really come to agreement that is you know, solutions and recommendations that have been put together by healthcare providers, you know, the immigrant community, people that represent, you know, all walks of life and everyone that sort of touched this pandemic. Um, but I will say that, you know, we have to have these systems in place, not just for say COVID-19, but for an earthquake or a natural disaster or some of the things that we're starting to see with heat waves and so on due to climate change. So I think we need to have better systems of communication in place and a plan in place for language accessibility and reaching communities that are not typically uh, on the radar for the government. And that's what I would like to focus on. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Yeah, I think that what we saw was the racial disparities that really were highlighted that we have been actually shouting from the mountaintops that were there that got really enlightened. And so I like that the state of Washington, that we move to try to service more communities of color, but that as we move forward, that we will actually incorporate them and integrate them into all of our emergency plans with each culture, each language is what I'm looking forward to. 
um, seeing done differently. Other than that, I think that the leaders across the state of Washington brought us through the pandemic safely and in an, a great economic space. So I think we did well, but I also would like to see more innovation as we move forward with uh, marginalized and underrepresented communities. Thank you. And Ms. Morgan, you'll go first on this next question. In the last biennium, Record funding was allocated to behavioral health, including substance abuse, treatment programs, outreach, and more. What additional member, me, measures, pardon me, what additional measures would you support to continue to address the needs of people with behavioral health issues? I would still uh, continue that we continue funding all the programs that we have in place now, but also keep working with my colleagues who this is their expertise in the behavioral health uh, space, but that can I as a state representative would continue to support all legislation that continues to have equitable, diversified and inclusive access to mental health services. As we have shown once again, there's a big racial disparity in those in the medical field period. And that's why I tried to get um, some money put forth for a black hospital um, to focus on communities of colors, healthcare, in particular black folks. And Ms. Mena. Yeah, so I think we still need significant investments in mental and behavioral health. We need all kinds of facilities from you know, outpatient to inpatient, everywhere that there are people, because anywhere that there are people, there's going to be a need for this service. Um, I did note that the legislature funded the 988 crisis line, um, which I think we're only the second state in the nation to do it. So as we get that off the ground, this critical resource for Washingtonians, we want to make sure that it's working well. We want to make sure that we're fixing any bugs and continue uh, to stay on top of this. Um, additionally, I know that we are lacking uh, mental health care professionals in schools. And we've seen an increase in suicides in schools. We've seen children struggling as they come back from the pandemic. And so as we're thinking about this, I wanna think about this holistically and how we're supporting our students as well. Thank you. Ms. Mena, you will go first on this next question. How will you work with your legislative district to enhance anti-racism? And when you mean the legislative district, you mean the residents of the district? Correct. And yeah. the organizations in the district. Absolutely. Well, we have a lot of work to do. Um, and in fact, this is something that I work on at uh, in my day job at the Department of Ecology, which is a state agency. And I think just getting folks to say the word anti-racist has been very difficult. This is something that I've seen um, come up more often with school boards, especially the Tacoma School Board, and something that I'm really excited to see. But we have a lot of work to do, not just in naming it and saying that we want to become an anti-racist government or anti-racist institutions, but actually putting in the legwork and the policies that will do that. So it's, it's definitely a lot of work ahead of us, but it's something that is top of mind for me, something I want to be very vocal and a leader on um, and make sure that we're you know, funding, whether it's outside consultants that can tell us where we're missing the pieces um, or critical training programs for our educators, for folks that are providing direct public service to our residents. Thank you. And Ms. Morgan, the same question. I think I would just continue on what I have been doing on passing equitable uh, uh, legislation and ensuring that internally in the government that we are being equitable as well. And I think that really it's about for me is uplifting black and brown people to come in and creating a pathway and access to the very positions that we are can, uh, running for today. The more people of color that we put at the table, then that means that anti-racist won't even be a, uh, an issue as we will already, already be inclusive when we're at the decision-making table. And that's what I will continue to do. I will continue to pass civil rights legislation that dismantles racism as I supported the only Office of Equity in, in the United States of America. So those things that I, as a third year legislator, I will continue to support and continue to bring my district's voice to the table. Thank you. Ms. Mena, you'll be first on this next question. What do you propose for statewide policies and strategies to address climate change? 
That's a great question. So we've done a lot already. The state legislature has passed the Climate Commitment Act, the Move Ahead Washington bill, the Clean Fuel Standard. We essentially have a lot of great bills on the books that we just need to implement. And I think the role of the legislature is going to be to ensure that those bills and the implementation of them are really fully funded um, and that we continue to support and upkeep them, especially as they make it challenged with um, with recent decisions coming down from the Supreme Court that are putting our authorities in question. I think there is some further work to do on clean buildings. I would certainly love to support that. And I wanna make sure that we are robustly funding the uh, mandates of the HEAL Act, which created the Environmental Justice Council to ensure that as we do this work, we don't do it in a way that creates greater disparity. We have a lot of health disparities. Uh, race is the greatest indicator of that disparity, even above income. So what we have to do is going forward, make investments in overburdened communities and making sure that we're doing climate work that is married with climate justice. Thank you. Ms. Morgan, same question. And, yep, just to jump off of what uh, she's uh, speaking of, we need to continue to educate and engage communities of color as they are the ones that are truly impacted by climate change especially in health wise, we have lots of asthma that we're not even paying attention to. This is part of what the pandemic highlighted on that we don't have equal access for healthcare. So of course, if you back that up into climate change and climate justice, we need to continue to engage all marginalized underrepresented communities and let them know exactly what it is that we mean because there's lots of confusion. I have been a part, a supporter of all of the climate bills that have come out of uh, the Democrat caucus. And I know that that is one of our um, number one buckets that we focus on. And that is what I will continue to support. Thank you. And Ms. Morgan, you'll be first on this next question. What are you willing to do to ensure Washington women have continued access to contraception and abortion? Will you vote to sustain House Bill 1851 preserving a pregnant individual's ability to access abortion care if there is an attempt to repeal it. Thank you. Um, I am pro-choice. And so we have passed in the state of Washington law after law that protects a woman's right to her reproductive system and, and, and her decision of what she wants to do with her body. That is not unusual that we get legislation that comes to try to repeal that in the state of Washington. This is why it is extremely important that we hold the majority so that we can ensure women's rights are upheld um, in when we move forward, especially in the climate that we are moving in. So I am best believe any legislation that comes forth that protects a woman's body, but especially we need to pay attention to black and brown women. Those are the women that do not have the access or the financial uh, means to go around and go and get health service in the first place. So we need to protect the, all women, no matter the color, no matter the socioeconomic status. Thank you, Ms. Mena. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. We've all heard it said that banning abortion doesn't stop abortion, it just makes it less safe. Um, that's especially true for women of color. So I, you know, 100%, we need to support this critical right to bodily autonomy in Washington state. I would go so far as to say that as soon as we have the numbers and maybe even before we push for a constitutional amendment to make sure that no matter who is in the majority, this is something that is always protected for women in Washington. Uh, and for women in neighboring states who may not have that option in their own states. I was really happy to see the governor forming a coalition with West Coast governors to say, you know, folks that need to come here and receive care will be able to do so in Washington. I think that is our mandate. And I think, you know, it's up to states to lead now that we don't have a federal backstop. And it's more important than ever that we elect leaders who, who understand this need and will support it. Ms. Mena, you'll be first on this question. Given that the Washington state tax structure is the most regressive in the nation, how would you change it to make it more equitable? I think we need to start by supporting the, the capital gains excise tax. Um, this is not a certainty that we have, but it is a critical source of revenue for important priorities that we have in the state, potentially childcare. Um, I think that's that's really, really important. And I, I wanted to note, I, I checked this on the Department of Revenue because there could be a lot of misinformation about this, but they estimate that this would affect potentially 19 individuals in the 29th district. 19 individuals out of 
upwards of 150,000. So we need to think critically about, you know, how we're bringing in our revenue and are we burdening working families? Um, you know, I would also support the working families tax credit. We know that that's coming online in 2023 and we have to do everything that we can to ensure that working families are not bearing the burden. So those are, those are two proposals offhand that I would support. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Okay, having issues. So yes, um, I am one of the, the people who voted uh, for capital gains. I voted for the tax restructuring as I am on the finance committee at this time. Um, and so I would continue to, as we work extremely hard to dismantle the regressive way that we are taxing individuals. And we, I did vote for the working family tax credit and I'm excited to see that come online and to see that help our struggling fam working families. And so I will continue to support um, any legislation that comes along the line in terms of ensuring that the right people are being the right amount of taxes and not being that we are regressive and always going after black and brown people to support, how to be nice, other people's dreams. Uh, Ms. Mena, you will be first on this question. How will you work with legislators in the other party to address state needs and avoid the type of paralysis that exists in Washington, D.C.? That's a really great question. Um, so I, you know, I noted last the last year that I worked in the state legislature, they did an analysis of all the legislation that came through and 90 percent of the bills that passed were actually bipartisan. They were not on, on party line vote. And all that is to say that we have the ability to get work done here. We have the ability to put our communities first and find common ground where it exists and really push those things forward. Obviously what gets the headlines and is attention grabbing is where we have disagreements and some of the more controversial legislation. But I think for the most part, we have the ability um, to do so. And as I mentioned to you all, I have experience working in the state legislature. I have experience working with the federal government, um, within the federal government and as a federal liaison uh, to the governor and in the governor's cabinet now. So I'm not a stranger to working across party lines and I'm really looking forward to doing so to bring home victories for the 29th district. Ms. Morgan. Yes, it's unfortunate that the state of Washington is always compared to the other Washington as we do tend to do more bipartisan work. If you look at my voting record and also look at the bills that I I have proposals or sponsored, they tend to be mostly bipartisan. Even including the civil rights bills in Juneteenth and the hair discrimination was a bipartisan vote coming out of the House and the Senate, which I am extremely proud of. There's um, when we are um, at a controversial place, it's not unusual. That's part of being in state legislature and working together. But I would continue to ensure that the people's voice is at that table and that we are putting people first and hopefully that we can come across as a bipartisan vote as uh, both sides are homeless, both sides are hungry and both sides are tired. And Ms. Morgan, you'll be first on this next question. What measures would you support to assure public access to the legislature after the session returns to an in-person format? Uh, we've been working on that even before the pandemic happened. We were working on remote testimony. So um, we actually got to really, really practice that. And so we are looking forward to if we, uh, uh, do return in person because no decision has been made at this time, but that it would be a hybrid because what we know in, this, in the 29th district is we have a transportation problem of people having their own cars to get to the Capitol. So it's inequitable. So I am looking forward to continuing um, for uh, uh, constituents to be able to testify remotely and um, being able to be engaged in the legislature. I have been fighting for access and pathways for all constituents at the state legislature since my first election in 2018. And that's what I'll continue to do as I am the leader that we deserve. And Ms. Mena. Yeah, I think critical to have continued remote access for folks that can't make it down to the legislature. Um, I think that goes hand in hand with some of the work that's already been going on to expand access to broadband and make sure that you know every student, 
every person who wants to participate in state government um, has access to get connected. So we'll need to continue that critical work. And I would say, you know, there's other ways to get involved in state government um, outside of just the state legislature. There was a bill, um, I don't know if it was this session or the one before, to um, take some of these volunteer board and commission seats and make them paid so that we can have folks participate who are working folks who can't afford to take a couple hours off work. So I think that's something we need to look critically at and make sure that we can open up those positions to um, folks of, you know, every stripe. And Ms. Mena, you'll be first on this next question. What do you recommend the state do to improve student safety in schools? I think our schools are still pretty dramatically under-resourced. I mean, the Supreme Court said that we, you know, the state has met its obligations under McCleary, but that's just not the story that we're hearing from educators, uh, from staff, from folks that are involved in the schools. I think one of the most important things we can do is, like I said, have nurses on site and mental and behavioral health counselors. I think students are struggling um, and I think that we need to resource them. We need to resource them. We need to create diversion programs and we need to create avenues for them to get help, not punitive options that will get them in trouble with the law um, or, or sort of, you know, target students of color for behaving differently than some of these educators are used to. So uh, that is what I will support. And Ms. Morgan. Yes, I've supported, actually we did support legislation to put school counselors in the schools. And so that has already been done. And also we have um, also banned weapons at public meetings uh, for school boards, as we saw um, this very contentious times at other school boards. So this legislature has taken um, um, uh, precautions and put things in place to protect our students. As we also, you can see in our gun legislation um, that we uh, 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 took away high capacity magazines. So I think that just overall in gun violence, that we're doing to um, for the whole state of Washington eventually leads down to our students and that we have red flag laws and et cetera, as we have seen in other states that are trying to use our laws in how to get it right. And so I think we take that seriously. And I think we did a great job in passing the legislation that we did and putting the, the dollars and um, the actual people in place. Thank you. And Ms. Mena, you'll be first on this next question. What policies and funding would you support to enhance equity for students across all school districts? So the question is about funding. So I'm sorry, would you repeat the question again? Sure. What policies and funding would you support to enhance equity for students across all school districts? Um, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, essentially right now we have a school funding model that is funded by the legislature and also property taxes, which has still created a disparity because areas that are able to pass levies can sort of support these extracurricular programs. I think there's probably room for greater supports from the state, but I don't have a, a very specific answer for you all. I'll defer to Representative Morgan on some of the work she may already be doing. Do I get her time? <laughs> yes, I do. Listen, um, I'm a former school board uh, director. And so I am always there to ensure that students' voices are being heard. And especially the parents' voices are being heard. And I think the state legislature as um, most of, you have five school board members that were just recently elected in my cohort that we were all there to ensure that equity was being brought to the school district. There was a very important piece of legislation brought forward by Senator Doss that ensured that all school staff members and school boards would now have equity training. If that happens, then that is ensuring that they are going to be servicing our students in an equitable fashion. So I'm excited that um, we are taking equity extremely serious and that we would um, expect that our school board directors would also come in line with us in ensuring that equitable education is happening for all students. Thank you. And Ms. Morgan, you'll be first on this next question. Since transportation is the biggest single generator of greenhouse gases, what should the legislature do to reduce those gas emissions? Well, Mena should have went first on this one because this is her area. <laughs> 
this is not really my wheelhouse, but I'll take a stab at it. I know that we've passed legislation already targeting some of those uh, uh, issues that are on uh, our constituents' minds as it is now. I believe for me, what I'm lo really looking for in the black and brown community is more education and exactly what that means so that we can engage in an equitable fashion. I'm excited that we passed legislation that um, uh, is on solar uh, power as we move forward in innovation that we are um, not my wheelhouse. I am really going to have to, I'm going to give my time to Mena. She gave me hers. Go ahead, Mena. You. you know what I was going to say is we're getting the wrong questions in the wrong order, but this is why we're going to make such a great team is because we've got some expertise in different areas. So that means the 29th is going to be in good hands with, with the both of us there. But I would say I, we got the low carbon fuel standard. That is going to be the critical piece that we need to fund and implement. The Department of Ecology is working to implement that. And so we have to continue to stay on the ball. Um, we've got a lot of funding available through the bipartisan infrastructure law that Congress sent our way, and we need electric vehicle infrastructure. So I'm thinking about how do we how do we make this a win-win for our communities here? How do we get you know folks that own gas stations and our small business owners to be the people that receive the funding for charging infrastructure? How do we get a win you know, that's both economic and environmental? So that's something I'll be thinking about critically, um, as well as we have a lot of money for clean school buses coming in the bipartisan infrastructure law. I want a lot of that to come to the 29th where we have uh, high air pollution. And of course, of course, of course, funding public transit and electrifying as soon as we can. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Mena, you will be the first on this next question. How will you work to reduce barriers for vulnerable populations such as elderly, disabled, low income, and people without homes? Barriers to what specifically? Sorry. Any barriers that uh, are in the way of them feeling happy with their lives? Yeah. <laughs> Sure, that is a very broad question, but um, I think some of some of the issues that we've touched on already in, in terms of transit, I think accessibility, certainly affordability. Uh, one thing I hear a lot, um, I've been very proud to get endorsements from the unions in the area, the Washington State Labor Council and, and you know, retired public employees and uh, whoopsie and so on. And I hear a lot about um, retirement and pensions and guaranteeing benefits and making sure that folks are able to live with dignity after retirement. Um, and so I think that's one thing we still have to think about is, you know, is there a cost of living increase? There isn't for PERS-1. Is there a cost of living increase that is actually enabling people to afford their medications, their groceries, and everything that they need? So this is a community I'm learning a lot from. I'm not the expert on this issue, but I've been very excited to learn so much and will continue to work to make sure that everybody in the 29th has an opportunity to live with dignity. And Ms. Morgan. Yeah, I'll add on to that. With the PERS-1, we provided in the last session a 3% cost of living adjustment for all retirees. And also, I think that what's really important for this demographic group is the Long-Term Care Act. Yes, we may not have gotten it right, but we're definitely looking at that and making sure that we get it right. It's a broken system that we currently have that is bankrupting our people. When we told them to save for retirement so they can enjoy their last days, that they're ending up paying more in health care is just unacceptable. And so we, with Washington Cares, we plan for their future. We want them to age in place and in their own homes and have the level of care that upgrade, upgrades to their needs. So um, we're looking to um, allow this life-changing safety that it's not being taken away, that you do um, spend your retirement and how you decided to spend it and not in getting resources and healthcare. Thank you. That concludes our questions for this evening. And now it's time for closing statements. Each candidate has up to one minute for a closing statement and we will reverse the order of the opening statements. So we will begin with Ms. Per Ms. Morgan, sorry. Thank you so much. This was hard guys, but very, very, um, very well put together. I appreciate you inviting us. As you can see that my future seatmate and I, and I call us M squared, 
remember that, that we are going to work very well together, that we have the issues of our community down. We've been listening to our, our district. We know that, and we walk, I walk the district, she walks the district, and we have gained the east side to our district to the 29th, and that's new. And so we are excited to bring the resources that they need back to the district. And we are also excited to make sure that their voices are heard at the state capitol and that they have a pathway and access to participate and engage. Thank you. My name is Melanie Morgan, and I am running for the State House of Representative for the 29th Legislative District, Position 1. Thank you. And Ms. Mena. Well, thank you. I want to echo the sentiment. I'm, I'm sweating over here, but I appreciate all the hard questions that make us think critically about what we're going to do as soon as we get there or, you know, as soon as as soon as Representative Morgan returns. But um, I'm really grateful for your time when I walk the doors and I've been I've been knocking doors in every single part of the district, you know, most days of the week, uh, whenever I can. I also work full time, so I, I spend every extra moment out there. Um, and what I tell folks is, you know, even if we don't agree, my commitment is always to listen. My commitment is to understand what the people of the district need and to go in, the, in there and do my level best. And that is, that is my commitment that I'm bringing to the community. Um, and I hope that I've earned some of your votes. Y'all made me work really hard for it, <laughs> but I hope that I can hear your support. Again, my name is Charlotte Benna and I'm a candidate for the 29th Legislative District, uh, position two for the House of Representatives. Thank you. I would like to thank the candidates who joined us tonight for position one, Melanie Morgan, and for position two, Charlotte Mena. Thank you also to our community co-sponsors, the Asia Pacific Cultural Center, Grit City Co-op, Latinx Unidos of the South Sound, the NAACP, Summit Waller Community Association, Tacoma Pierce County Affordable Housing Consortium, Tacoma Urban League, Vibrant Schools, and the YWCA of Pierce County. For viewers, please be sure to vote for the candidate of your choice before election day, August 2nd. You should have your ballot on or shortly after July 15th. Please mail or use the Dropbox to deliver your ballot as early as possible. Thank you also to our timekeeper, Terry Baker, and the committee who planned this forum. Be sure to read your voters pamphlet and look up vote411.org where you can find answers to questions posed to the candidates. Thank you for watching and don't forget to vote.